So I'm Julie Bogart. Brave Writer is my company. It is a homeschool language arts and writing program and it is designed, oh here let's get all my stockings in. Um, it is designed to help families with kids between kindergarten and all the way through high school, although we've had some college kids occasionally and even some preschoolers, but the vast majority fall between K through 12. And what we do in Brave Writer is we support not just the output of children, but we also train and help parents to become effective coaches and allies in the writing process. In addition, because I homeschooled for 17 years, because I've been hanging out with homeschoolers for nearly 30, and because I have a passion for family life, I also encourage and help homeschoolers feel successful in their home education journeys. So one of the topics that keeps showing up in the places where I talk to home educators is what is it to have a satisfying adult life as a woman, usually, although we may have some father homeschoolers in here. Oh, I'm glad you're here live too. Um, how can I nourish and enrich my life when I am so depleted, giving out so much stuff to my kids? And here's the crazy thing. While I am always trying to take the burden off of you in homeschooling and create space for you to feel that you are not overwhelmed, it sounds like maybe I inadvertently laid a burden on some of you when I said that one of the best gifts you can give your kids is to lead an awesome adult life so that they will be inspired to want to become awesome adults themselves. So this is what we want to talk about today. I have a little Facebook community, look at me popping out here, um, called Brave Scopes for all of you Brave Scopers. And people ask me questions there and talk about our scopes. And this question was asked today. That's why I'm doing a quick scope about it. So if you want to participate with us on our Facebook group, go here, facebook.com slash group slash brave scopes. And that will help you be more a part of this community. And I'd be happy to have you there. Yes, so many things that are meant as permission can feel like a burden, and we're actually going to talk about that. That was well articulated. So if you haven't done it yet, please share this broadcast. One of the ways to do that is you swipe to the right. If you are on an iPhone, you swipe up on an Android, and you tap the share button. And let all of your followers know that we're talking about this. It's a very important topic. It's one I'm passionate about, and here's why. We talked a lot about the enchanted education on these scopes. The idea that your children deserve a life that has surprise, mystery, risk, and adventure. And it is easy for me to help you feel like you are doing great things with your life by enriching your children's lives. And I want you to know that's entirely appropriate. That's what we want to do as homeschoolers. We want to create a rich life for our kids. We want them to feel on the inside like the experience of learning is deeply satisfying and is advancing them toward this eventual destination called adulthood. But what happens if we spend all this time preparing them and we ourselves are watching our own adult lives go by? Now, is it enough? to home educate. Is that enough of a life for an adult parent? Let's just sit with that for a minute. Am I somehow saying that the choice to be a homeschooler is not enough? Is that what I'm talking about when I say be an awesome adult or lead an awesome adult life for our kids? For the sake of giving them a vision of what it's like to be an adult, is homeschooling not enough? Anyone want to take a stab at that? This is interactive. I'm happy to have you answer my questions. Am I saying somehow that homeschooling isn't enough? What do you think? Don't think so. It's not enough for me. Depends on how you do it. Thank you for this feedback. This is what we want. It can be enough at different seasons, but there may need to be more. No, I love it. Enough for me. Life has many facets. No, no. So there's a mixture of answers here. 
not if it's just a canned curriculum. Okay, so we've got a mixture of feedback coming in. I don't hear that in what you're saying, but what do we do when our kids are out of the house? I know it's not enough for me. Is anything enough prep for adulthood? I think it depends on the person. Mixed feelings, not enough, but feels wrong to say that. I'm realizing after five years, it's not enough. Okay. Okay, I'm going to let you keep responding because I know you'll each read each other's feedback. Okay. So here's what I want to share with you. I'm going to take a little backwards journey into my own experience as an adult woman surrounded by home educators and involved in that process over the last 30 years. I knew about homeschooling before I was married. I was involved in a missionary community where everyone home educated. This has been a question in my life and around the people I know for as long as I've been an adult. I got married at 22, so that gives you some idea. I'm 54 now. So this is not a new issue for me. This isn't something I just dreamt up this week or I thought would be a cool topic for scope. It's mattered to me from the time before I was even married. What is it to be an adult woman? Now I'm addressing women specifically because I think men have a different sense of identity around work and family life, even when they choose to homeschool. So they're in a slightly separate category, but if we have homeschooling fathers in this community, you're welcome to jump in and give me your feedback because I am curious and interested. So here's what happened to me. I'm gonna tell you a little story about me. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the homeschooling communities I've been a part of. And I'm going to share with you some comments and observations made by the homeschooling moms I am friends with who are no longer homeschooling, who are alumni, who are now in that period where the kids are gone and they want to know what to do from 50 to 75 or 80. Okay, so life is long. Let's start with that principle. 80 years is a long time. And when you are 22, there's a lot of life left. And when you're 45, you're about halfway through it. So let's think about 22 to 45, and then 45 to about 50, and then what happens after that. Let's kind of look at these blocks. I didn't have time to make a lot of note cards tonight. I have a big video shoot happening tomorrow, and I'm supposed to be getting ready for that right now, but I really wanted to do this first. We'll, we'll do a little scope from there so you can see the behind the scenes. It'll be fun. Uh, but anyway, Look at how many of you are in your 40s already. Okay, so this is what I've noticed. Marriage and having babies is an absorbing occupation for a, a young adult, assuming, of course, that you become one of those people who gets married in their 20s. Now, today, a lot of people aren't getting married till their 30s. But let's just say the beginning of your adult life that involves marriage and children is entirely absorbing, whatever age you are. And it's deeply satisfying. You are discovering all kinds of things about human dynamics and biology and the interactions of relationships and traditions and what it means to be a family and how families are a building block to civilization. This is actually what's going on for you and it's fully absorbing and it is worthy of all of your energy. And it's very satisfying. I think as a woman, I found pregnancy and breastfeeding to be the most powerful sort of biological experiences of my life. I wouldn't trade them. I loved it. I loved birth. I loved the whole journey. So that's why when we come into that period of decision making around homeschooling, for many of us, it was a no brainer. We're already in love with parenting. We're already in love with the power of having babies and having children and creating from nothing. I mean, if we're talking about creativity, how is birth not the central creative act in all of time? Well, it is. I mean, it's unparalleled and it's powerful. So we've all had that experience. Even if you are an adoptive mother, you are involved in the miracle of child rearing and becoming a conduit for that person to become a meaningful member of society. You are their source of life. 
whether or not you gave birth. So all of us in this homeschooling journey are those kinds of moms. That's what we're about. And it's easy to become completely absorbed in the rearing of children, yours or adopted. And of course, adopted children are yours, but I'm talking about biology versus adoption. And obviously, once they're yours, they're yours all the way. So as you're making this journey, the question arises, should I be doing more than this? Is this what I was born to do? If women exclusively have children and raise them, is that their dominant contribution to the future? Well, here's what puzzled me in my early 20s when I started having babies. My first baby was born at 25. As I was gearing up for that, I started asking this question. If raising children is all I'm born to do, and if that is women's primary work, then who is making Coca-Cola? <laughs> who is designing software? Who is owning restaurants? Is it all men? Are all the societal jobs, all of the professions, are they only for men? Is the highest good that a woman can contribute her family, and does it deserve exclusive devotion? Because if that's true, then in our homeschools, what we are communicating is that the boys are the one. Yes, well, of course, or unmarried women. It, that's true. So we could say men and unmarried women. But if we're saying that the highest calling is having babies, then don't we almost look askance at unmarried women? Like, well, the, the best use of a female's life is children, if we say that, it diminishes the unmarried woman and it relegates all of the tasks of humanity to men. And for me, child of the 70s, <laughs> that was unacceptable. I grew up with feminists in my life and I wanted to know if it was possible to be absolutely head over heels in love with my children, so devoted that I was going to stay home with them, raise them myself and educate them, and still keep a foot out the door, contributing to the larger good of society. The way I see it is this. Each person makes it to adulthood with a unique contribution to make. And it might be related to all that child rearing and home education you've been doing. I mean, hello, look what I'm doing. I'm not bottling Coca-Cola, <laughs> you know? I don't work for Microsoft. I'm very much related to what came from my past. But what I wanted to suggest to you, and when I'm talking about awesome adulthood, is your mission, if you choose to accept it, is to identify both the passion you have for your children's lives and to express the who you are-ness that evolved to adulthood out into the world, into the larger community. That's what I think is what I'm about because I don't wanna squander the incredibleness of this gift of personhood that is mine alone. And it's not that it isn't being given generously to my children, absolutely, but it is in conjunction with the person I also believe I was meant to become or that I want to become or that I think is a privilege to become. And so there had to be in my mind some way to balance those two. And I had all of these conversations in my 20s and 30s with women who were really championing the cause of coming home and raising our own kids. You know, in the 70s, a lot of women went back to work and they got childcare for their children. And those kids grew up my age and a little bit older and said, uh-uh, I wanna be with my kids. But then that looked regressive. It looked anti-feminist. I've actually had to defend my choices to my daughters. Like it was pro-woman to choose to stay home, to not be told I had to stay home, that I had no other option. 
No, it was pro-woman. It was saying, I get to decide. I get to decide how I spend my life. And I choose to spend it with you all. And I'm going to protect the part of me that is meant to bless the community beyond my family. And I'm going to keep that little flame alive. I'm going to keep it alive because someday you're all leaving me. And I want it to kick into high gear when that happens. So you know what I did? I protected writing because writing was my thing. And when I had nursing babies and I was living in foreign countries, I kept writing. When Noah was a baby and we lived in Morocco, we had, of course, no internet. This was the 1980s. They didn't have the internet yet. I had no telephone, no TV. I had books, I had paper, I had pens, and I had a roof. And when Noah would nap, I would go up on the roof with a chair and my journal, and I have written so much fiction you will never see <laughs> up on that rooftop. And when I would go and visit with my Moroccan neighbors, I would come home and I would write detailed notes because I knew someday I was going to write that historical fiction novel. And I also wrote letters and I also worked on foreign languages and I also learned how to bake and cook in a foreign country because I knew all those experiences were going to contribute to my writing life. And the rebound was amazing. They contributed to my life, to my sense of competence as a person. Now I've shared before that in Morocco, women were known for baking bread, keeping house, uh, sewing clothing, doing very domestic things. They were quite industrious and quite good at it. I had a history degree from UCLA that did me no good. <laughs> and nobody was impressed by it. I had to learn to bake bread from scratch, you know? How to identify the good wheat and the bad wheat. How to identify the good wool and the bad wool for my sofas. This was all quite a big learning curve for me. I, I will get there. Uh, and I learned it. And I continued to keep notes and to become a more full person. So during those early years when I was living, you know, married but no kids, I was starting to build my own sense of self. Many of you have done that. You've worked jobs or you've read or you've studied. But I also, once the babies came, I just kept my foot in the door of writing. And at first, it really was just personal writing, just something I did because I knew I needed that for me. I also participated in our work. We had work to do in Morocco, and we I actually gave a talk at one of our conferences, four different roles for women on the field. And I walked through, <laughs> it's so brazen, right? I was like 24 years old. I was gonna tell everybody how to be. But this stuff was going on in my brain. And I, I had all these choices and I considered them all valid. One was to not do the work, just raise kids. Another was to raise kids and do hospitality. Another was to raise kids and participate in the work. And another was to just do the work and not have kids. And I presented it to all of our group because it mattered to me that women were intentional. I wanted to be intentional. I wanted to know what my choices were amounting to. I didn't want anyone defining that for me. Okay, so fast forward a few years, couple more kids, and of course, pregnancy. Oh yeah, which door are you keeping your foot in? We're gonna talk about this, I promise. We are going to talk about this. Um, as my kids started coming, into my life, they took up more of my time. So obviously, during the early years of motherhood, your foot isn't in the door very much. I think I kept a written journal. That was about as much as I could muster with a colicky baby and pregnancy. I got very sick in my pregnancy with Johanna, so I didn't do anything. I couldn't even do laundry. So there are moments where the task of motherhood is absolutely top priority, you should only do it and not feel any guilt. And I hope that you will. Even during those times, even when I knew I couldn't do anything else, I knew that I would. 
And maybe that's what I'm trying to communicate tonight. Just knowing who you are is so essential to this journey. So you don't get lost in the lives of other people. You are facilitating your children's lives, but their lives are their own. They're not yours. You are nourishing and nurturing and giving them the love they deserve, but those are their lives. And you are choosing and living yours right then too. So immerse fully in motherhood in those moments when it's demanding and you need to. I know for me, one of the things I did is I dove into understanding family dynamics. That was really important to me. I also became a La Leche lead leader, of course, right? I mean, don't you imagine that I would want to do that? <laughs> so we had meetings in my house and I was on phone duty answering breastfeeding questions. I did that for about 10 years. I didn't do it a ton. Like I wasn't one of those, you know, total take over the La Leche League community. I had a role and I played it and there were times when we could lead meetings and times when I chose for my family not to. But again, having that outlet that combined my family with something that was educational and that matched sort of the life stage I was in, that helped me keep alive interpersonal dynamics Inter understanding how family functioned. And if you see what I do today, clearly all of that is a part of who I am and a reason why I was excited to coach homeschoolers because that's kind of been my personality my whole life. And I kept finding ways to sort of grow that aspect even though I didn't know where it would land, even though I didn't know where it would go. As I entered the homeschooling experience, my vision grew. Now, before I explain the homeschooling piece, let me just tell you, I was reading books that were making the case that being a mother and a stay-at-home mom was the supreme role for women. And in some cases, women were looked down on who didn't choose that life. That was part of what I was reading. And that bothered me. I fully supported and loved being a mother. And I fully supported and loved being a homeschooler. But it bothered me that we were told that there was one right way to be as a woman, as opposed to simply validating that choice. Do you know what I mean? Sometimes there's a defensiveness around stay-at-home momming that I don't think is necessary. And here's why. You only feel like you have to defend it if you feel like it is a diminishing thing to be told that you're not doing enough. Does that make sense? So you suddenly, if you think that people are saying staying home with your kids is not a worthy thing to do, then suddenly it's like you have to make it into this big only thing to do to prove them wrong. And that's just not necessary. It's not necessary. You can choose to do it and it still doesn't have to be the best, most wonderful thing that anyone could possibly choose. That's defensiveness talking. That's not power. That's not empowerment. So the best thing to do if somebody gets on your case one way or the other about your choice is to say, yeah, it just felt good to me. Yeah, I thought it was a great idea. Oh, you work, you know, for General Electric? That's awesome. Tell me about your job. I, I will tell you about mine. Like that. We don't have to prove that it's better than other decisions. It's just a decision. And the person who's a woman, whose kids are in childcare and who has a full on career, well, thank you. Thank you for working in your career and bringing a female presence into the workplace. Thank you for proving that women can work in corporations. I'm grateful to you. I'm not resentful of you. And I trust that with the love in your heart and your passion for your family, you will work out a family life that I can admire and be excited about. And I hope you'll do me the favor of feeling that way about me. That's the posture you want to have. At least that's the posture I wanted to have. I didn't always have it, but I've grown to have it. And I early on realized that I was grateful that women took the risks they took in the 70s so that we could even have candidates for president who are female right now. Because our world needs 
females in positions of power. And the first place that I see that happening and what makes me so proud to be a home educator is women home educating. Just think about that for a minute. You are not just washing dishes. You are not just keeping house for a man. You have chosen a career of education just as worthy as all those school teachers who get up every morning and drive to a building. Okay, you're doing the same thing. It's a career. So that part of it is well established. Here's where I think it's slightly different than leaving the house. Your kids know you as mom. You are not in a professional role in their mind. In my mind, you're in a professional role. In the community of home educators, we need to remind each other, you're in a professional role. It's okay if you hire a housekeeper because you have a career. You are home educating, my goodness. It's a career. It's an entrepreneurship. You are running a business. You are the superintendent, the curriculum director, the teacher, the principal, the dean of students. Your spouse is the janitor. Like, that's it, right? The spouse isn't the principal. Please don't tell me that. Unless he is engaged in home education with you every day, you're the principal, okay? <laughs> this is a big deal to me. I'm all about my women. So listen, you have a career. It's called home education. And you are also a mother. But in the eyes of your children, you're a mom who's doing homeschool, okay? And what that means is your kids don't quite see you in the same way that you and even your peer community see you. They will someday. They will someday get it. But when they're children, it's just you and kids living in a house, doing your thing. So even though I was slowly pulling together writing, La Leche League, family dynamics, you know, a part of different groups that had little leadership roles. We all do that stuff, right? We serve, we join volunteer committees, we do all kinds of stuff. And our kids notice that we do those things. But what they may see in all of that is just this big sort of rubber band role of mom, doing mom things, right? So what I want you to remember while you have this career of home education while you are learning all about family dynamics, because, hey, you're in charge of all that. <laughs> you just are, sorry. It seems to fall to the wife, falls to the mother. While you're figuring all that out, someone asked me, how do you find that door, the one that I said I was keeping open? For me, the door was writing. I was keeping my foot in the door. What is that door for you? What is that door? What is that spark of you that is yours, that isn't your kids, they don't lay claim to it, that isn't your spouse's, he doesn't lay claim to it, that gives you a sense of your own vitality as a person, that helps you transcend the role, because you're jammed into this role. You're going to be seen as mom and wife. That is the leftover legacy of pre-feminism, that women's place is in the home, that mom is just the woman in the house. So I want you to remember the spark. Now, people are saying all kinds of things. You guys are so cute about all these TED Talks. <laughs> Somebody told me they actually nominated me for one. So I don't know. I would love to do it, but thank you for saying that. Right now, what I love is this, because you are right there and you're my people. This is, you're my people, right? Like we get each other. I don't know if the whole world understands this. This is homeschool speak. This is for you. This is for you guys, because we speak the same language and I get it. So listen, listen, because here's, here's the thing, the role is defined by the culture and has been for centuries. And our attempt to break out of it looks like we're stepping back into it by staying home, raising children, 
and educating them, which is our edge. That's our thing. So keep learning. Door number one, keep learning. While your kids are learning, be excited about what they're learning and expand it for yourself. You know, when I was talking um, before on one of these scopes, I shared with you a woman's community I started at the beginning of the 2000s. We called it the Trapdoor Society. It was our way of escape. <laughs> and it began with discussion of film, books, theology, politics, parenting. It was this rich field of learning for us. I wasn't learning about art so I could teach the Charlotte Mason way. I was learning about art because dang it, I'm a member of humanity and art tells the story. And I want to know what everyone's been up to for the last several centuries. That's why I wanted to learn art. That's why in the middle of the day, instead of doing math, we watched videos about art. That's why I started reading Jane Austen, not because it was on a syllabus, not because somebody told me I had missed out on it, but because I saw You've Got Mail and didn't get it. I read Jane Austen to find out what didn't I know. I'm a member of this thing. How do I not know these cultural touchstones? I want to be in on the inside joke. Don't you? Oh, happy birthday, Jane. That's awesome. You want to be a part of the story of humanity. You want to give comments on it. You want to be a political person who votes with a conscience, who understands the issues. You want to watch movies and allow the filmmaker's message to reach you, the adult woman who is making choices and living in this world and expressing herself so that other people are changed and moved and helped into being who they should be. This is why you are raising your kids to be educated. Why wouldn't it be happening to you? And guess what? It's going to happen to you so much better than it's going to happen to your kids. Are you kidding? Are you kidding? What 10 year old can be moved the way you will be moved by education at 42? Any movie you watch with your kids, is going to speak to you 10 times more than it speaks to your kids. And you're at the right age to take in the message and let it transform your life so that you can take that message of how it's changed you and benefit others. This is what I'm talking about. When I say awesome adulthood, I don't just mean taking up kayaking, though I'm about to talk about that. I mean, having a rich mind life, becoming a full person, exploring and expanding the woman you are. Because you get to, you're old enough now, you get to. The library is there for you. The art museum is there for you. The night sky is there for you. And if your kids witness that, <laughs> education takes care of itself. In fact, you will be so not interested in nagging them because it wastes the time you could be using to read the rest of Jane Austen, right? It's like, why nag them? You could be over here growing, so go grow. I often tell parents, when your kids are really failing, get a hobby, go do something else. <laughs> Get interested in something. Stop being so interested in your kids. Be interested in you. You are so important. You are so precious. Who you are is so valuable. And you are old enough now to appreciate it all. The stuff you wish your kids would appreciate, you didn't appreciate it at 10 or 12 or 15, but you can now. Let me tell you about my mom. My mom is in her 70s. She was that kind of person. I don't know if she even realizes what an impact she had on me. I tell her all the time, but like, I'm going to cry, so just get ready. <laughs> so I keep thinking about her. My mom always had theater tickets in L.A. Like, they had a subscription to them. My dad had hockey tickets, so my mom had theater tickets. She's like, 
I'll go to your hockey games, but you're coming to the Mark Taper Forum with me. We're going to see plays. Then she bought theater tickets for the kids. Most summers, I went and watched plays put on for kids because my mom valued theater, but she didn't just value it for me. She valued it for her. My first symphony, my mom took me to it, but my mom goes to the symphony. She still goes in her 70s. My mom read books about psychology and understanding family dynamics, and she would share those with me when I was growing up. Now, famously, she read, I'm okay, you're okay. I don't know if you guys know this book. It's from the 70s, huge hit. <laughs> and I'll never forget, it talks about three different levels of development, your child, your parent, and your adult. Your child is like a child. Your parent is that nagging, trying to control everybody, and your adult is this mature person who is out of their child and no longer in their parent and can relate peer to peer and appropriately. Well, famously, we were arguing one day and my mom is up at the top of the stairwell and I'm at the bottom and I have not done something I was supposed to do, like fold the laundry, I don't know. And I was really complaining the way that you do when you're like 12 or 13. Yes, games people play, exactly. And um, all of a sudden she yells down at me and says, Julie, you are in your child. And I yelled back at her, but mom, I am a child. Okay. <laughs> That was how I grew up. My mom taught me to love nutrition because she was passionate about nutrition. She didn't say, you can't have sugar because it's bad for you. She said, try plain yogurt with honey and walnuts. We'll call it a yogurt sundae. She didn't say, we're cutting out meat because it's unhealthy. She said, how about fish broiled with tomatoes and Munster cheese? Like that's how my mom was. She started reading like cereal boxes when we would be in the supermarket and she'd be like, see if you can find EDTA because if that's on there, we're not buying it. Why not? Well, it's a preservative, blah, 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 right? That was my mom. When she and I would work on writing, I would bring her a piece of writing. Well, then she brought all of her writing talents with her. My mom, for those who don't know, is a professional author. She's written 85 books and has taught writing for 50 years. She began when I was in seventh grade and her very first article was called A Trail of Tips for Young Writers. She sold it to like the Boy Scouts uh, magazine and got $25. <laughs> and I remember that day. And I remember when, um, <laughs> I remember when she started teaching at my high school the uh, adult extended education class. I remember that because I was proud of her. Oh my God. Okay. So let me explain something. Your kids want to be proud of you. They want to be proud of you. When I ran my very first marathon, two of my kids, were in the water station handing out water. They were really proud of me. They told all their friends. They put it on their Facebook. They, want, they were proud of me. You want your kids to have reasons to be proud of you that are independent of them. You know why? Because it's too big of a burden for them to turn out so you'll feel okay about yourself. You need to get your source of yourself, that sense of self, apart from whether or not they turn out. You get it? My mom had that. She had that. And she shared so much of her life with me. She was so involved in my life. She was at the front row of every play I was in. She was the person who cheerleaded all of my gymnastics meets. My mom was there. She wasn't absent doing her career. It's just that she had a life. My mom's in her 70s. She goes car camping with a group called the Gray Hairs. They have camped all over California for the last 30 years. And the oldest person in that group is 80. My mom climbed Mount Whitney at age 57. Like she's amazing. 
and I want to be like her. That's my role model. And so my life, when I had my kids, included learning to play guitar, learning how to knit, learning how to make six weeks of meals in one afternoon and freezing them all. It included how to be good at breastfeeding, how to give birth naturally. It included becoming able to critique and analyze film and literature. It included a degree in theology. I did my master's in my 40s. Someone asked me today, how did you do your master's while you were raising your kids and homeschooling and running a home business? Well, I did it one class at a time and I had good support and I didn't have any toddlers. <laughs> I couldn't have done it then. All my kids could make a sandwich and tie their own shoes. And uh, my husband at the time was supportive. You have to have support, you can't do it alone. But I took it slow. Uh, a full-time master's takes about two years, it took me four, and I did summer school. Four best years of my life. I literally skipped out the door every time I went because it was mind food for me. My son Noah wound up taking one of my classes with me because he wanted to study ancient Greek. And so we did that together. And some of my best conversations with my teenage kids came from what I was studying in grad school. My son Jacob, he's into human rights. Right now he's getting a human rights law degree at Columbia Law. His goal is to work in the UN, in the human rights division. You know, that's what he wants to do. And it came from conversations we had about social justice from my program. You can't know what you're imparting to those kids, but what you can know is if you are growing as a person, if you are keeping alive the individual that you are, separate from everyone else, your kids are gonna see it. And they're gonna be proud of you and they'll admire you. And you will be reciprocally sharing that back with them. It's unavoidable. It's unavoidable. And at the same time, you will be nourishing your family instead of nagging your family. I had a phone call today from a mom. Oh, okay, wait a minute. Let's answer this question first. Okay. Financial need is powerful. So somebody's asking about money. Like what if the financial need makes the adulthood not feel awesome because the work is hard and it's not satisfying? Finances have birthed some of the greatest creative acts in our history, a lack of finances, poverty. If you are in that place where you don't have money, and believe me, I've been there. I mean, we didn't have health insurance for years. We, didn't, we had a single income that did not feed our family. And it was out of that that I started figuring out how to make some money from my writing, which eventually led to the birth of Brave Writer and every single product in the whole company. Now that's my story and you'll dismiss it because you know me now. You don't know me then. And so you'll say, well, it worked for you, but that can't happen to me. That might be what you'd say. I know I would have said that years ago. But let me say this, I have faith in you. You can recreate your life at any moment. You can, and financial need is a huge motivator. So you want to start opening up your heart, your eyes, and your options so you can see what is there that you're missing. My mom, you know, she did tutoring and started writing in, or, in order to bring in a little extra money. That's what she did. And so where I was going a moment ago, I had a phone call this morning from someone whose son is really struggling and her kids are not homeschooled even, they're in school. And so we started talking about all the stuff that she's going through. And what I realized is that sometimes the pain in the family, whatever that dynamic is that is unhealthy and not good, is actually interfering with every aspect of life, education, finances, work, pleasure. If the overwhelming feeling in your family 
is either dysfunctional or painful, you got to address that first. Jane Austen isn't fun to read if you're crying yourself to sleep every night because you're miserable. There isn't any space in your emotional capacity to be moved or transformed if you're miserable. So you need to address whatever is ailing you. You got to get honest. How do I end every one of these broadcasts? Live honestly, write bravely. You have to live honestly. You have to get to know your own dysfunction. And it's scary because so many of us have it. And it usually means taking some kind of action. You've nailed it, Heather. You have to do your interior work. That's right. It can be scary. You know what's scarier? Not doing it. <laughs> Not doing it. But I trust you. You'll know when and how. Therapy helps a lot. 12-step groups help a lot. Support groups for homeschool can help a lot. Some can hurt, but most can help. Yeah. So I want to come the rest of the distance of our ages, okay? So as you get older, you can carve out some space for yourself once those kids are not quite as dependent. I took tiny weekend trips. I went to an art museum with a friend I met online who is a homeschooler, and we met at the Institute of Art in Chicago, and we spent a full Saturday together and one night in a hotel, and that was it because we needed that. We took chances to get away. Uh, I made sure that our family got to go to Italy because we had relatives there, and I knew that would be good for our family. So we saved money for years and years and years, and we made it happen. There are ways. You just have to think about ways to incorporate into your life. Will it cost you time with your kids? Yes. I missed Johanna's only goal she ever scored in soccer while I was at the Art Institute in Chicago. But you know what? I think she's okay. <laughs> I pretty much saw everything she ever did. And sometimes that's okay too. You're home with them a lot. It's okay for them to have some experiences without you right there all the time. Yes. So carve out small amounts of time. It's not like you have to commit, you know, forever. You can, or commit huge quantities. Uh, just a little tiny space. If you like art, if you like reading, you probably can't do five things. So pick one or two. What about the balance between those activities and burning out? Yeah, don't take on too much. It might mean that you have to scale back on something in your homeschool. Oh, what a thought. Maybe there's one aspect of your life that is a little less creative to make space for something for you. And don't do it if it's stressful. Don't do it. Just wait. Yeah, if you have babies, how much can you do with babies? How much? Maybe you can listen to podcasts while you're breastfeeding. <laughs> Maybe that's what you can do. Yes, the one thing principle, Emma, absolutely. I do not want this to be a burden. Please do not hear this as one more thing you have to do or you are not welcome in the homeschooling world that I'm in. Absolutely not. Maybe right now it is enough to just know that the hope of something for you exists in the future. Maybe that's enough. Just knowing that can give you some space to breathe and to let go of being overly burdened by your current circumstances. So my friends who are in their 50s, whose kids are all grown, this is what they say. It varies. Oh my goodness, my, my little phone is about to die. <laughs> We're going to have to wind this up. It varies. They have a circumstance where some of them have not cultivated and they get to the end and they don't know what to do. And then others have done something. And when the fifties come, it's not so daunting. Now, many of them have gone back to teaching at co-ops because hello, they're career educators. Well, that's awesome. Teaching other people's kids is a whole other dynamic. It's wonderful. Hello, that's what I do, right? I've taken all those educator skills and I've channeled them into another kind of educating. 
fabulous. That is absolutely appropriate and wonderful. You get to decide for you. And so many of you already have ways that you're contributing through, you know, your various Etsy shops and different organizations where you're making some side money for the family. That's really all I'm talking about. Keep you in the homeschool equation, okay? It's not just your kids. You're there too. And allow the vibrancy of self-education to leak into your family. It's not just about their brains. It's yours too. You're in the prime of life when your brain is the most powerfully connected, making that science of relations happen. This is it, man. Get it, girl. That's what I want to say. You go get it. You deserve it. It's time. Your brain is ready and your kids will benefit. But mostly, it'll be good for you. Introverts don't have any problems. Introverts are perfect. Don't go out there. You stay home. You read that stack of books. You figure out what you can do remotely. Introverts have it easy now. They got the internet. There is so much good you can do from home as an introvert. Absolutely. You don't have to get out there. You don't have to get out there. Now, kayaking. <laughs> my big dream of my whole life is to own a kayak, and I still haven't done it. But it's great to use your body. We've talked a lot about your mind, skiing, running, surfing, kayaking. I went on a surf trip for my 50th birthday just because. Because I grew up near Malibu and I never went surfing. So body and mind, spirit and soul. Nurture them a little bit in alternating seasons. Maybe you spend more time on you in the summer and less time during the school year. Okay, I vote for that. Just keep something alive and allow yourself the privilege of adulthood. And then, because it'll be clear that you're an engaged adult, your kids will pick that up and they'll think, hmm, being an adult will be cool. What you don't want is what I've heard. Kids who say, oh, God, oh, I don't want to be a homeschooler like my mom. Guess what? I know some grown kids like that. Why would they say that? Because it's not a compelling vision. So your mission, if you choose to accept it, is to wholeheartedly invest in your children and in yourself. Pedals on a bike. One is up, the other is down. One is up, the other is down. And over time, you'll get the balance and momentum, and you'll have such a rich life. So I'm going to close before my phone dies. <laughs> Today, we talked about awesome adulthood. Look at my cute little woman. That's you. That's all of you. There you go. I can't wait to meet you at the retreat, to talk to you on our Brave Scopes group or to meet you in the Homeschool Alliance. We've had a surge of new members and I'm excited for you to participate in our community. Thank you for coming tonight. We'll see you tomorrow. We're going to do a, a, a video shoot of me and some tea time and uh, we'll do a periscope from behind the scenes because that'll be fun. All right, see you all tomorrow. Yes, please talk about this on Brave Scopes. Absolutely, love you all. Ready? Live honestly, honestly, write and live bravely. I'm Julie Bogart from Brave Writer. See you guys tomorrow.